Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode. Today we are talking about Venom, Let There Be Carnage. I had the opportunity to go see this one a little bit early. I saw it on Tuesday. Um, it's safe to say that Tom Hardy is Eddie Brock. He is great as Eddie Brock. He's great as Venom. Uh, Woody Harrelson is great as uh, Carnage or Cletus Cassidy. The problems with this movie do not arise from the cast or the script or the action or the humor in the film or even the tone of the film because the film knows exactly what it is. The film is very much like Evil Dead 2 or something similar with uh, sort of, it's not a horror movie, but it has sort of, you know, those horror -y elements mixed with a lot of comedy. And so you've had, you have this sort of odd couple feel with Eddie Brock and Venom and then you also have the humor that arises from that, from all the other characters surrounding them, especially when Eddie is, you know, trying to lay low and keep a low profile and Venom keeps talking to him and he's talking back. Um, there's a lot of scenes like that where they're just really funny and the entire audience was laughing here. Um, Woody Harrelson as uh, Cletus Cassidy is fantastic. Uh, this isn't the role he was born to play, but it was a great choice for Cletus Cassidy and Carnage. Um, the action scenes in the film are uh, incredible. Uh, when you see Venom and Carnage actually get down to fighting with each other, uh, it's breathtaking. Um, now, the big issue is that they uh, they don't last very long. The movie doesn't last very long. The movie is only 90 minutes. It's about 97 minutes or whatever with the credits and something else added because people flipped out when they said, oh, the movie's only 90 minutes. It's a big issue. Um, basically, everything that uh, doesn't work in the movie, like the character development, uh, the pacing, um, it feels like it's on fast forward the entire time. Like, everything is happening very quickly because you only have... 90 minutes to tell this entire story and for a sequel usually the movies don't get shorter they get longer because you need to add more stuff in so it doesn't it, it doesn't make very much sense why they would just basically neuter the movie um the 90 minute runtime there is a silver lining because it does feel like it's so fast it does it's a nice speedy movie but for people that are wanting a little bit more out of the characters and to see more of the characters and their motivations and, and all of that it's really it's really short and uh it's really jarring when it ends because you see the the climax of the film and then it's just over and you're like well what the hell what what, what happened why is the movie over all of a sudden some of the characters um like michelle williams's character Anne, is just not really there for the movie she she shows up um she helps out she's sort of the damsel in distress um that eddie needs to help but it's she's just not there for very long and she doesn't get very much development here um same with her boyfriend dan he doesn't he's just kind of there they kind of they even make a joke about it at the end um like oh he didn't need to be there it was venom talking that's my great venom voice in the morning here um you know he didn't really need to be here but he was there and so maybe if you had an extra 15 to 20 minutes of the film you could um give more to her character and you could give more to Cletus and Naomi Harris's character. Uh, their relationship is also very weird and strange. You get a lot of flashbacks to their childhoods, but you don't end up actually getting like that development between the two of them. And then when the f switch flips at the end of the film, it just kind of happens. Um, so you have a lot of stuff like that that are really, really tied to the fact that this is a 90 minute movie. In my written review that I wrote, which you can read in the description down below, um, there was just a lot of issues with the movie that, uh, go from, like, the fact that it's 90 minutes long. It just needed to be a longer movie. This is a big budget Sony Pictures Marvel production. How did this happen with somebody? Andy Serkis, the director, does a good job with the action scenes, with the, all the scenes in it. He definitely can direct a movie. Um, it's just that, Maybe it was the studio interference. Maybe all the footage that they shot was too violent. I don't know. A lot of the movie feels like you're watching like a horror movie or an R-rated movie on TV. And sometimes that's cool. Sometimes that's really cool. I like I like watching you know R-rated movies to see them get edited and they get extra scenes. They get extra scenes a lot of the time. Uh, this one, it just felt like it was like, okay, cool. He's going to bite this guy's head off and we're not going to show it. Oh, Carnage is going to like kill all these people, but it's just going to look like they're sort of getting ragdolled around it's it really doesn't 
have that punch that you would want. This movie, and probably the first one, should have been R-rated, most likely. Come on, Sony. Um, who knows if, if Marvel's going to do that with Deadpool or anything like that. They've said they will, but um, who knows. This movie very much felt like it should have been R-rated. And I'm not saying that as just some, you know, horror hound, gore hound that wants to see more gore. It would have actually benefited the film because it would have beefed it up a little bit. You could have had this 90-minute runtime and then had the the promise or the... Uh, the premise of, oh, this is filled with more violence and more gore, and that'll make up for the fact that we don't have any character development and that our movie is 90 minutes long. That could have been something that they went down, but instead they sort of split the difference and made it PG-13 and made the violence off screen or made it so that it's covered or that it's not really happening because you could tell that somebody's dying when Carnage is flinging people around and turning into a tornado, um, but they're not actually being shown as dying, so... That's what you got to get with uh, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Um, outside of that, the movie itself, like I said before, very entertaining, a fun movie, but it uh, does have issues with that runtime and the character development. Um, all the effects look great, like Venom and Carnage both look amazing. Um, uh, it, it probably would have been better for Carnage because in the movie he does feel there's like two polar opposites. It does either feel like, oh, this is unbeatable, or, oh, this is eminently beatable. And so when Venom is fighting him, it's like, okay, cool, yeah, no, Venom's going to win. It's just going to happen. Because um, he's indestructible and, like, all this crap happens. And it's like, okay, well, what's the, what's the point here? Why is he fighting him and he doesn't feel like he's actually, you know, a threat? And then when he's killing people that are not Venom, it just feels like he's completely unbeatable. Like, nothing can stop him. Guns, you know, more guns, more people, helicopters, whatever. So you do have the catch of, like, Naomi Harris's character being able to project, like, sound waves out of her mouth. Um, and the, the, the thing of, like, oh, fire and sound beat them, so they use that throughout the movie to sort of incapacitate them. But it, it, it just kind of cheapens it, and it makes it so, like, oh, Venom doesn't really beat, beat them. Um, you know, it's something else. Um, I'll try not to delve into spoilers here. Um, so, Venom... Let There Be Carnage was a pretty decent movie. It was fun. It was entertaining. Uh, but it has pretty big issues with its runtime being only 90 minutes and its character development and sort of everything that comes out of the fact that it is a very short film. You are left wanting more as an audience. You're left wanting more as a fan. And then it's just kind of over. Um, the post credit scene, which I'll mention after this, spoiler alert, don't scroll forward if you don't want that spoiled for you. It's just kind of going to overshadow the movie. Uh, I'll just say that for now. You can f hear all about it after this portion of the video. Um, but let me know what you guys think of Venom. Let there be carnage in the comments if you guys uh, like the movie. When you're going to see the movie. If you're going to see the movie. If you like the first Venom movie. Whatever. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And do all that cool YouTube stuff. Because it really helps me out. We're on the way to 500 subscribers. We got to 100 earlier. We blew past that with the uh, the Iron Maiden Sinjutsu review. So thank you, thanks to everybody who subscribed. And let's get to 500. And uh, I will see you all real soon. Thanks for watching. If you don't want to get spoiled, um, make sure you pause it right now and stop because I will be talking about the mid-credits scene. Uh, this is what probably everyone is going to be talking about because it's the most uh, important thing to come out of this movie. Um, so, end credit scene, Venom uh, has to escape to Mexico and go off and live with Venom because they're on the run. They're in a hotel room watching a Spanish, tel Spanish telenovela, and Venom is commenting on it. And then all of a sudden you see an orange flash of light, and Venom and Eddie Brock are in a hotel room on the beach. Um, when J. Jonah Jameson starts talking on the television screen and shows a picture of Peter Parker's Spider-Man, and then Venom says something like, I know that guy, or I like that guy, or something like, I, I blank that guy. And then he starts licking the screen, and then uh, this gentleman whose hotel room that they're in pops out and says, hey, bro, what are you in my hotel room for? That all but confirms that uh, Venom and Spider-Man are in the same universe. Spider Peter Parker's Spider-Man was supposed to show up in the first Venom movie, and he didn't. Um, but this basically confirms that. Now, that orange flash of light, that could be a lot of things. It could be um, the multiverse at the end of uh, Loki exploding out. 
It wasn't orange, but who knows. Or it could be Doctor Strange's spell from Spider-Man No Way Home. You can see it in the trailer that he messes up because Peter's talking or something like that in the movie. That probably is a decent explanation for it because the J. Jonah Jameson's footage and speech is from the end of uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, but it could be another broadcast, who knows. Um, we'll have to go back and compare the two when we can. But this is incredibly important for the MCU because it means that the Sony universe and uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe are sort of connected, at least for the moment, um, because of that deal between Marvel and Sony. Now, that also could mean that Sony is going, okay, cool, we'll take um, Tom Holland's Peter Parker and Spider-Man, we'll take it back, thank you. And we'll put them over here in our own film universe against uh, Morbius and uh, The Sinister Six and all of that. But we'll have to see when Spider-Man No Way Home comes out or and when uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness comes out, because I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of... Uh, stuff like that in that film.